I have here beside me uh, Professor Cheryl Saunders of the Melbourne, Melbourne Law School, my former professor here, and the foremost expert in intergovernmental uh, relations or IGR. Uh, Cheryl, thank you for uh, giving time for this interview. It's a great pleasure. So to start, uh, can you uh, give a, a brief explanation of this concept of uh, intergovernmental relations or IGR? Yes, I'm happy to do that. You know, there's nothing uh, mysterious about intergovernmental relations. Uh, if you have a system in which there are two levels of government, as uh, you now do in the Banks of Moro uh, area in the Philippines, uh, then you have uh, power divided in some way uh, between them. Uh, you assume that uh, each level of government will exercise its allocated powers, but there will be times when the levels of government need to work together because uh, uh, their powers uh, need to complement each other or need to be uh, sorted out. And intergovernmental relations is there for that purpose. So, uh, as uh, I've learned from you, IGR is really a feature of a federal system. So, what could be the benefit for a unitary system like the Philippines to institute IGR mechanisms and what could be the challenges? Look, it, IGR is not solely uh, applicable in federal systems. Uh, it certainly is always applicable in federal systems because uh, federal systems always divide power between two levels of government. But if you have another system, a unitary state like the Philippines, um, and you put in place some arrangements whereby uh, part of the country is given uh, some uh, powers for the purposes of self-governance, then once again you have two levels of government uh, and uh, IGR is perfectly applicable uh, in that context. Uh, the dangers are, of course, that uh, because it's a unitary state, you don't fully appreciate how important it is uh, for each level of government, nevertheless, to allocate its allocated powers so that the uh, s s uh, system still operates in a way uh, that's over-centralised. But as long as you're aware of that danger, uh, it uh, should work in a unitary state as well as in a federal state. All right. So, as you may know, the Bangsamoro Organic Law, or the BOL, recently ratified by the Bangsamoro people, uh, mandates the organization of several IGR bodies. Mm -hmm. Now that that task now belongs to uh, the Bangsamoro Transition Authority which is the interim government uh, in the Bangsamoro. What, uh, what guiding principles should they consider in uh, fulfilling this mandate of organizing IGR bodies? Okay, well I think there are some practical um, issues that uh, need to be addressed in looking at those uh, IGR bodies. Uh, I think that the, ba uh, that the organic law is very interesting in the way it sets up those bodies, uh, but there's still a need for some operating rules for those built bodies, decisions about, for example, um, the issues that the bodies deal with, how often they meet, uh, what their decision-making rules are, what arrangements are made for transparency, uh, and so on. Um, but I think the basic principles on which those uh, uh, bodies should operate uh, are also very useful to think about at this stage and I'm really delighted that you're uh, raising that question now um, because however intergovernmental relations bodies work, they need to respect the division of powers. They need to accept that this is a, a system in which a democratic decision has been made to divide power between two levels of government, so that however intergovernmental relations work, uh, it needs to respect uh, that model, uh, and it needs to res each level of government needs to respect the others as a representative of the people or the part or a part of the people uh, of that country. Uh, so that should be a principle uh, animating um, the system, um, ensuring that multi-level government works mutual respect between the levels of government uh, as democratic representatives of the people. The other principle that I think it might be useful to bear in mind is the principle of transparency. Uh, there is a big risk that intergovernmental relations uh, becomes far too opaque, far too hard for ordinary people or even stakeholders involved in the system to follow. 
partly because they're complicated or potentially complicated uh, and partly uh, because uh, by their very nature these bodies tend to have members who are members of the executive governments and executive government is not the most transparent uh, part of the system of government. So I think to provide a set of procedures that ensures that there is some transparency for the decisions being made by those bodies and how they're made um, is a very important principle on which they should be based. So in this, in this spirit of uh, transparency, should the civil society also have a role in these IGR bodies? I don't think uh, civil society needs to participate in the IGR bodies as members, uh, if that's what you mean. But I do think um, civil society has several important roles here. Uh, one, uh, I think civil society should be aware of the significance of these bodies uh, and follow their activities and be prepared to criticise uh, when the body is not working uh, as it should be. Um, and secondly, I think that the IGR bodies themselves should accept that just because they're working together as governments doesn't avoid their need to consult with the public about important decisions that are made. So if um, there is a decision of some kind uh, coming up in one of these bodies uh, and it's a decision that has major implications for the country or part of the country, uh, as a whole, then there should be the same amount of consultation with relevant members of civil society as there might be for a decision taken by uh, one of the levels of government alone. So as my final question, so the, the lifespan or the time frame for the BTA uh, to meet this mandate is just three years. Mm -hmm. So can, uh, what practical uh, preliminary measures should they consider in fulfilling this mandate? Well, in some respects, um, what we've been talking about uh, already suggests the mandate. So I think for um, the transitional body to think about the principles that might animate uh, these bodies, to put some basic procedures in place for those bodies, to experiment with the operation uh, of these bodies so as to fine tune those principles and procedures would be very useful. Um, the big challenge that uh, I think you will face uh, at this point, or the big challenges perhaps, uh, one, this is a very new mode of proceeding for the Philippines, or at least so I'm assuming, um, but secondly, um, the Bangsamoro Authority itself is really just becoming used uh, to the idea of autonomy and the exercise of its own powers, and that's really a risk as it's developing its own capacities and its own understanding of what its role is. There really is a risk that um, the IGR bodies will become too centralised to fill the gap. Uh, so that insofar as the Banks of Morrow Authority is not exercising functions or not um, picking up the, the role that it's assigned by the organic law, uh, that the central authorities will assume uh, those powers uh, and so that the you know, intergovernmental re relations bodies will just be another forum through which uh, the centre really achieves whatever it wants to achieve and I think that that's something that both the centre and the authority need to keep an eye on because it's in everybody's interest to make this system work. So thank you very much uh, Cheryl for giving us uh, your time and sharing your insights on IGR and the Bangsamoro uh, community is looking forward to seeing you uh, in the Bangsamoro to uh, teach us some more or share some more of uh, what you know about IGR. And I'm very much uh, looking forward to being there uh, as well and to understanding a lot better on the ground uh, how the system's working. So thank you.